This story happened three years ago. I, Marcus, was 21 at that time and just finished my basic training in the army. It was the first time in three months that I was at home and, of course, I felt like a super hardcore war machine. The first day at home, the annual fun fair took place in our village, but honestly, I just wanted to go to sleep, so I refused when my friends asked me to go drink with them. I went to bed at 2pm right after my arrival and slept about 4 hours until my ringing phone woke me up. I looked at the display and saw that Marie, my ex-girlfriend, was calling. We didn't break up in dispute and claim ourselves as still friends. I answered the call and asked if I could come over and have an eye on her two cousins who are 5 and 9 years old because her parents are not at home and she wants to go out with her girls. She thought I was home for two days and knew from my sister, which she asked first, that I wasn't going out on the fun fair. And even though she apologized and said I should stay home after I told her that I was home since today, I agreed and walked over to her house, which was only ten minutes away. I arrived and knocked on the door. Moments later, she let me in and introduced me to two young boys, David and Joshua. After telling me the rules like not too much candy, no TV after 9 p.m., and the promise not to come home wasted and no later than 2 a.m., she left the house. I placed myself on the big couch and watched television while the two boys were playing in the living room around me. I told them if they need something, they can just ask me. We ordered pizza and I even had fun playing with them after we ate. It was about 11.30 p.m., David and Joshua were sleeping in the guest room and I sat in the dark living room watching Netflix on my phone when I heard a strange noise from the backyard. It sounds like some metallic clanking. The blinds were shut so I couldn't see anything. I went to the window and spread the blinds only a few inches and scanned the backyard. I saw nothing. But then, chills ran down my spine as I saw the shadow of a head peek over the fence. At this moment, I was 100% sure that this was actual danger and not just some drunk guy from the feast who had gotten lost and ended up here. Marie's house was more than one mile away from the town hall where this took place, literally on the other end of the village. And why should a drunk person sneak around the house? I turned my head to check that all the windows were closed. When I looked back in the yard, the silhouette was gone. I was still tensed and had a bad feeling, but I went back to the couch and tried to convince myself that it was an illusion and I'm just overtired. I must have dozed off for about 20 minutes when I woke up by trampling from upstairs. I looked to the door and the boys came inside. Joshua, the younger one, was crying and David pointed in the direction that they were coming from. Marcus, he said with a trembling voice. There's a man at our window. My stomach felt like a brick. Was the shadow in the yard real? I told them with a calm voice to stay here and wait, but inside I was shaking. In the dark, I sneaked upstairs, holding a kitchen knife in the right hand. The floorboards creaked, but the loudest thing I could hear was my heart racing. The door to the guest room was slightly open, and I could look inside and see the bed, which was slightly illuminated by the shine of the moon. The sheets were crumpled. David and Joshua clearly left in a hurry. A little breeze of cold air came towards me and my worst fear had come true. The window was open. My hands were shaking as I pushed open the door easily. I stand in the doorway and wasn't able to move inside. You coward, I whispered to myself. After a minute of standing there like a statue and staring in the room, I made a step forward. I searched around and under the bed. Nothing. I opened the closet. Nothing. A bit relieved, my plan was to check on the other rooms. I went out into the hall again, walking slowly along the wooden floor and grabbed the door handle of the bathroom. I wanted to push it open, but in that moment, someone from the other side was pulling it and literally dragged me inside. I stumble forward and the next second, I stand face to face with a black dressed masked man. I almost soiled myself in that moment. We stared at each other for maybe three seconds before he pushed me back against the opposite wall and ran downstairs. I dropped the knife. It took me a few seconds to realize what just happened. I hear the kids screaming in fear. 
I got up, rushed to the stairs when the sound of shattering glass filled the house. He tried to escape through the front door, but it was locked and, I guess in his panicked brain, threw something through the big window in the living room, tearing apart the blinds and somehow made it outside. I chased him into the yard, where he jumped over the fence by using a garden chair as a step. I looked over the fence and saw him sprinting into the nearby woods. Back inside, I called the police and tried to calm the boys. As the officers searched around the house, they found a ladder outside the fence. It was at that exact spot where I saw the shadow earlier that evening. Three days later, the police caught the man and he was arrested. They informed us that he was a wanted criminal who had recently kidnapped and ended the lives of five children in the last two years. This was literally the worst night in my life so far. Let me preface this horrifying reiteration by stating that I was a 19-year-old female college student attending a rural university in Pennsylvania. I am also a quadriplegic and, as a result, use a wheelchair. It was one warm spring afternoon in the rural college town where I was currently staying. I had just restarted my studies after taking a semester off to recover after a devastating infection had ravaged my spinal cord, deadening the nerves in the base of my neck, leaving me with no use of my legs and weak hands. I was struggling to adapt to my new lifestyle and, if you're from the north, you know that there is no such thing as flat when it comes to landscape. My campus was teeming with hills and frost-wedged pavers, which made navigating the terrain all the more cumbersome. This is relevant, so bear with me. I just made it to a particularly tumultuous hill, which always gave my arms a good workout when I stopped to gather myself before ascending. About halfway up, I had to turn sideways to keep from rolling back and catch my breath. Out of what seemed to be nowhere, a thin, bronze-haired boy appeared. Hey there, you need help? You look a little worn out, he asked. I sucked some air and nodded, grateful for his offer. He grabbed the push handles on my chair and began to push me to the top of the hill. It really is a shame that you have to do this alone. Being in a wheelchair can't be easy, but you make it look good. He quipped, still pushing. Uh, thank you, I think. I replied, kind of annoyed. Oh, I didn't mean it in that way. Pardon me. I, I just think you're beautiful, he said apologetically. I nodded a thank you and pointed to the building to my left. I can take it from here. Um, I didn't get your name. Brian, sophomore philosophy major, he responded, smiling. I can take you to your classroom. I don't want you to wear yourself out before you go back to your apartment. My face flushed and I turned to look at him. Ryan, forgive me, but how did you know I live in an apartment? His face twisted a sort of stifled grin mixed with regret. Oh, I, I've seen you come out of the square a few times, that's all. I turned away and without offering a farewell made my way to class unassisted. Here's the thing, Ryan couldn't have known I lived in the square. Local, but not very local apartment complex. Why? I didn't wheel from there to campus. It was too far. I always got a ride with a friend, Lacey, and she always picked me up in the parking lot behind the building, which was away from the street view. The only way Ryan could have known that I lived there was if he lived there himself, or if he just so conveniently had been in that parking lot when Lacey picked me up. Breathe. Why on earth would some random follow a crippled girl around? I wheeled to my class and for the next two hours sat in a haze. When class was over, to my surprise, who but Ryan, the philosophy major, waltzed into the room. Hey there, I figured you'd be done by now and wanted to see if you needed any help getting to your apartment. Which apartment number are you? Maybe I could come by and we could study. I asked. Oh, I live on campus, but it's probably better you don't come over. Uh, my roommate is a little bit messy. He replied, 
visibly nervous. I'm sorry, I just thought that you might want to hang out, besides pushing me around, you know, because of what you said. I, I do, I just uh, don't think we should hang out at my place. Maybe yours. He said flirtatiously. Well, I did not think that one through. Tonight isn't a good night. I have voice coaching, but maybe tomorrow. I squeaked. I was so nervous, I knew I messed up big time and there was no coming back. I am not the type to really say no, and this was and will be my undoing. He agreed, but ended with something that will haunt my dreams for eternity. Apartment 109, right? The one with uh, two peepholes and the butterfly art in the window? I was absolutely floored. I think by that point my jaw was paralyzed because it was on the ground. I stared at him with such intense dumbfoundedness that literally minutes must have passed before I could regain my ability to speak. I mean, I didn't. I just stared at him. I'll take that as a yes. See you tomorrow. He turned to leave and I, by the grace of all things holy, happened to notice that he left his stack of textbooks on the desk next to me. I grabbed them, being the nice girl that I try to be, and set them on my lap to take home so I could give them to him tomorrow. As I was leaving the building, the slight downgrade of the ramp caused the books to slide off my lap. Cursing my crippled existence, I leaned forward to pick them up when I noticed a particular rough-looking notebook. It was your typical I'm the next Jeffrey Dahmer black and white composition book. It was decorated in metallic gel pen with hand-drawn and, breathe with me, stick figures. Okay, not terrifying, but you know what really struck a chord in my already overloaded brain? One of the figures was a girl in a wheelchair with rope around her waist. Besides the illustration, a tiny blurb in bright red ink read, Wheelchair bound. Can't move. Can't run. My 19-year-old mind was immediately going to Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I was very reluctant to open the book, and on the first page was my name, my apartment complex, my apartment number, as well as intricate details of my specific unit that someone could have only known had they been inside. On the next page was Lacey's name, the make of her car, when she picked me up, then my class schedule and an accurate description of my parents. The third page was stained and very worn, and big calligraphic lettering was her skinny legs. My best recollection, the book was later seized by the police. I dream of her, bound, my hands tracing the frame of her wheelchair, my tongue gliding up her skinny legs. Floppy, lifeless limbs rock side to side in my arms. Those skinny legs. I place her ragdoll body on the bed, too weak to fight, bound by body. I reach down and... Well, you can guess where that went. I paged through this disgusting notebook and became sick, physically ill. There were photographs of me, on campus, in my apartment, and even in other public places. All the photos had her skinny legs plastered somewhere on or near. I placed this manifesto in my bag and went back into the building to find a professor, any professor, just someone who wasn't Ryan, the philosophy major. Long story short, I showed my professor the notebook and Ryan was arrested. He was charged with conspiracy to commit certain crimes, stalking and possession of CP. Yes. He had that in his dorm room as well as a shrine to my skinny legs. I am now 26, living in a different state, and thanks to Stalker Boy, I will never view someone offering assistance the same again. I'm writing this here to raise awareness of how normalized harassment has become because... This story was dismissed by anyone I did tell it to. I was waiting at the interchange, collection of bus stops, which had about six people already there at my stand. 
I had just finished a seven hour day at college and desperately wanted to go home. It was about 4.30ish and the bus wouldn't arrive until 4.50. I didn't really pay attention to the people other than a teenage girl who was experiencing an anxiety attack, which is only relevant as it was the reason for why I spoke to the man who sat across from me. He seemed like your average white dude, he looked about 30, was missing a tooth, and whom I noticed kept looking up from his phone at me. This man moved seats to sit next to me and began to ask questions like, what's your name and what college do you go to? I couldn't lie as my lanyard around my neck literally gave him the information he was asking about. It was a conversation I had had with random people who had sparked conversation with me during the short bus journey, so I answered him, not thinking much about it and holding my phone in my lap. He quickly changed the subject and began asking about intimate details about my relationships and whether I had a boyfriend, which stupid 16-year-old me replied no. I ignored the weird questions about my body count as it was definitely something that set off an alarm bell and I did not feel comfortable talking to a complete stranger about it. In doing this, he started commenting on my body and looks saying that any guy would be lucky to be my boyfriend and reached out to touch my nose piercing. This obviously made me uncomfortable and I brushed the weird comments off with thanks. He didn't stop with the comments and began to compare me to his celebrity crushes, Allison from Pretty Little Liars. Pretty weird for a 30 year old to crush on a teen and ask how tall I was. I replied with my 5'6 and he said they didn't believe me. He proceeded to grab my arm and pull me up making me stand up in front of him. I was surprised that he even laid a finger on me, especially with witnesses around, and I looked at him. He was looking me up and down, so I sat down immediately. I checked my phone to see that the time was 4.38. I had to sit at that bus stop for 12 more minutes with this guy asking me uncomfortable questions and touching me. We didn't talk for a few minutes, and I breathed a sigh of relief thinking was over and that he had finally decided to leave me alone. Nope. Do you want to get out of here? He asked. I'm going to go smoke with my friends. You should come. I shook my head and told him I had to go home so I could go to work. That was a fat lie and also a big mistake. He asked where I work and I lied and told him that I worked at McDonald's. I thought he didn't believe me as he paused for a few seconds, but then said, Ah... It's a shame. We should meet up again soon, though. I gave him a weak smile and nodded. Keep in mind that this man is twice my age, telling me that I'm his type and asking me to smoke with him. He then asked about meeting me over the weekend, but I told him I would be in a different part of the country to visit a family member. Another lie. Fair enough. Uh, you gonna be in this town on Monday? I knew I couldn't lie about it as he knows I attend the college in that said town, so I said yes, but stated that it was only for education reasons. By some miracle, the bus came. I then realized that I know I'd be stuck on this bus with this strange man who would now roughly know where I lived. I began to internally panic, looking around for literally anyone that could separate this man from me. I had moved towards the bus and was now stood up. He had followed and was in front of me, still talking and still moving closer. He took any opportunity he could to place his hand on my arm or on my face. By this time, I was full on shaking. I was terrified about telling this man to leave me alone. If he was bold enough to touch me in public, I had no idea what he'd do if I finally put an end to it. I noticed a woman glancing over at him and then at me, before walking over and taking his attention away from me. I took this opportunity to back away and could no longer hear the conversation she was having with him. He walked back over to me and said, We'll meet again. Before wrapping his arms around me without my consent and then walking away, the woman double checked that I was okay and even sat next to me on the bus, telling me that she had been listening into what he had been saying to me and was watching his actions. She advised me to tell a trusted guardian and also the police about this man. I did tell my grandparents, who dismissed it immediately as it's something that happens to everyone. This experience has completely shattered any confidence that I had. I removed my nose piercing and dyed my hair in hopes that I would be unrecognizable to the man I only met once. 
It's been four months, and I think about him every time I have to go into that town and every time I have to use that bus. I have yet to see him, and I hope it stays that way. And to that guy who harassed me at the bus stop, I hope to God you haven't treated other girls the same way as you treated me. I'm a 17 year old girl and I'm used to seeing and hearing things but this weird experience it just has me freaking out. So I wake up and my room just feels off, very weird, and then I hear someone calling my name over and over again, sounding like a little girl's voice. Obviously I'm super confused by this because I'm the youngest of my siblings so I sit up in my bed and turn around to where the voice came from and I only had time to see blonde hair and a blue dress because she starts to just speed towards me and I just shove my face into my bed because I'm terrified. I have seen ghosts before, but this felt different. And then I feel someone walking on my bed and I hear that same voice, but now it sounds confused and maybe even worried. I keep my head down. And then it gets cold, incredibly cold. I start to shake because it's so cold and I feel someone shaking me and that voice calling my name over and over again. I feel like crying and like I'm about to have a panic attack and then it just disappeared. But I feel like I'm not alone, like someone is watching me. So I check my phone and it's six in the morning. I look around the room and whisper myself, what was that? And after a long pause, just staring at my floor. Then out of nowhere, my nose starts running, and I saw blood dripping down from my nose, and now I'm incredibly paranoid. And that's why I think that there might in fact be some sort of demonic child in my house. This is the day after, and I still feel like someone is there, this strange presence. I made a cross, and... My sister read that salt will help keep demons and ghosts away, so I hope it works. Growing up, my father had a job delivering newspapers. Some of my earliest memories were going with him on the paper routes, and that is where I got my love for 80s metal and the peace of nightfall in nature. He did home delivery as well as deliver to businesses and even a hospital. This is where the story begins. I remember it's just a typical night delivering papers. The sky was starry, the moon was bright, and I believe it was a warmer month, possibly April. I remember we pulled up to the hospital to get out and deliver the bundles of papers. I was maybe 12 or 13 at the time and had always felt anxious around and in hospitals. To paint a picture, there is a smaller hospital and there is a ramp on one side for emergency vehicles and another that goes around where you can enter in a non-emergency fashion. We had to go through two hospital double doors and as we get there, I couldn't believe my eyes. The doors open and then close by themselves. There were flashing lights coming from the inside, almost as if the fire alarm was triggered. However, there were no sounds as a normal traditional fire alarm, just flashing lights. I looked down and there was a small area where you can just see the doors and that's when I saw it. Two legs of what looked to be from a little girl, maybe eight or so. I don't remember past this part because I was so terrified. I don't remember the reaction of my dad or if he even saw what I was seeing. I never did ask him. It's like time froze at that point. To this day, and as I type this, I have no recollection of what happened after that. I assume we dropped the bundle off and left, but I don't really know. This is something I've contemplated on posting on here for a while. I can't explain what I saw that night, and some people might not believe me, but I assure you this is a true story. I went on the paper routes most nights since then, and mostly were all normal nights, but that night, I will never forget. My parents are married, 
I am a female and I have a younger brother who was six at the time. My parents like to move around and we are rarely in the same place for more than two years. We just moved into a new house in Boise, Idaho. This house was possibly one of the most adorable houses I have lived in. To understand this story, you have to know the layout. When you walk in the front door, right in front of you was the kitchen and the back door to the backyard. To the left, you had the living room and to the right, you had the staircase to the basement and a hallway. If you walk down the hallway on your left is the small bathroom and farther down, there is my little brother's room and my parents' room. If you go down into the basement, you could either take a right or a left, but we had one of those circle basements where you could walk completely around it. If you take a left, you would get into the TV room and the door to our two-car garage. Continue walking and you will get into our playroom and connecting to this is my bathroom. There is a door on the left that leads to the playroom and a door on the right that leads to the right hallway. Right across from the right door there is our unfinished laundry room and shower and farther down that hallway is my room. If you continue down that hallway, you would end up back at my stairs. So now we get into the story. When we moved in, I claimed the downstairs room and my brother claimed the upstairs room. Everything was fine for the first few weeks, but for some reason, I refused to sleep in my room because when I was down there, I would see orbs and feel a presence standing over me. Eventually, we would find lights turned on or doors left open that we had closed. My dogs would bark at seemingly nothing and it was always cold for some reason. My grandmother had always been able to detect presences in certain places and she refused to go downstairs. After about six months of living there, my brother began to have night terrors, something he had never experienced before. They began to happen more and more and it was to the point that none of us were sleeping at night. One night my friend was over and we were falling asleep and we heard something drop. We got up and looked over the side of my bunk bed and the pillow that my little brother was sleeping on was in the doorway. Many nights we would wake up to his pillow in the exact place in the doorway. We had to put up with footsteps and voices almost every night. My brother's night terrors began to get even worse. After a year to the date of living in that house, my little brother woke up screaming and he jumped out of bed, mumbling. My mom and I were asking him if he could hear me with no response until he screamed, yes I can hear you, and began to punch a hole in the wall. Our wall was very hard and my brother was a skinny six year old and there was no way he should have had the strength to break this wall. He began to shake and continued to repeat, it's going to blow up, it's counting down. He repeated this for at least five minutes until his eyes unglazed and he just fell asleep. This became a weekly occurrence and each time he wouldn't remember what happened. His anger was through the roof. He was constantly screaming, hitting, and kicking objects and people, threatening to hurt himself. One time he chased me with a butcher's knife because I accidentally spilled water on his t-shirt. Within a year, my sweet, forgiving brother became this horribly scary human being. Eventually, we moved out of the house after two years of torture. Recently, I brought up this story with my grandma, and she told me she went to see a psychic and the psychic told her that there was a spirit of an angry soldier attached to my younger brother. She did some research on my house, and she found out that the entire neighborhood that I lived in was once a camp for sick and dying soldiers during the French-Indian War, and that my neighborhood was notorious for paranormal activity. It also was home to a fire station and a retirement home. Now, four years later, I'm now 14 and my brother, he's 11, he still remembers nothing and he doesn't have night terrors anymore but still has anger problems. Me, this still terrorizes my dreams and I can't go back in that neighborhood without getting the chills. My mom and grandma refuse to talk about that house and I feel there is more, I don't know. The story happened when I just turned 18. My best friend and I, who I am still best friends with to this day, had planned a massive party in my house as my parents and younger siblings had gone away, specifically so I could have the whole house to myself. I'm not a very loud girl, I'm quite shy and often described as cute. My best friend, however, is the complete opposite. 
He's very loud and colorful and never fails to be the center of attention without trying. He had invited over 200 people and surprisingly over 150 responded that they were coming, including the guy he liked which he was more excited about than I was. If you couldn't already guess, this isn't exactly my ideal way to spend my 18th, a bunch of sweaty strangers, drunk out of their minds and eating me out of house and home, but this was my 18th and my best friend was planning it all so any blame would go his way. As usual, whenever we were going to an event, my best friend forced me to doll up. Whenever I did this, hardly no one ever knew who I was, as my usual look is normally barefaced, my hair is in a high ponytail, big stereotypical nerd glasses, and the most baggy burgundy jumper known to man. However, tonight I was, as he likes to call me, supermodel of the world, in a tight, very short black dress, black heels, very well done makeup and my hair actually down and curled for once, and as predicted no one knew who I was when the party started until my best friend stood up to give a speech. I got a lot of attention that night from a lot of guys in our year at school who did know that I had such an amazing body under all that knitted hoodie, something I don't enjoy being told. So I spent a lot of the night brushing guys off who wanted to bone the hottest girl of their year. Yep, I hate that as well. My best friend was busy looking around for the guy that he liked and was on edge constantly checking his appearance. I assure him he looked amazing and did not worry about it. He then went on to how he was hoping to lose his virginity tonight and went on how maybe I should do it tonight as well. It would be a funny story to tell our children when they became best friends just like he and I did. I brush it off and tell him I would be doing no such thing but agreed to meet him for coffee the next day for him to go into detail as he liked to do. It was about another two hours of guys hitting on me and asking me why I hadn't looked like this before when finally my best friend began smacking my arm and telling me that he was here. But his excited tone changed when he realized that the guy he liked had shown up with my best friend's older brother. We'll call him X for the story. My best friend's older brother made his way over to us and began conversation and wished me a happy birthday to which I responded with a thank you. My best friend of course told him to go away as this was an invite only party. X went on with saying that he was invited as the guy my best friend invited was his best friend and he was his plus one. My best friend huffs and walks off, leaving me with X. Now whereas I have grown up with this guy, I mean grew up with him, he was five years older than me and my best friend and our parents are also best friends, X and I hadn't really interacted with him much after I hit puberty when I turned 12, so for the past six years he was just my best friend's grumpy older brother who would roll his eyes every time he saw me or had to drop me and my best friend off somewhere. But tonight he seemed different, he was trying to keep the conversation going with me. We took the conversation to the sofa and he continued to supply me with drinks. He turned out to be more interesting than I ever really knew him to be. He liked a lot of the same stuff as me and we had a lot in common. A lot. He was more mature than the guys in my year and told me about how he was surprised at how grown up I had become. Around 3 in the morning everyone began to empty and thanked me for an amazing night. I was still wobbly at this point so I hugged everyone goodbye including my best friend who was indeed leaving with that guy. I gave him a massive kiss and jokingly tell them to use protection. Once I was sure everyone was gone, I shut the door and headed into the living room when I heard someone coming down the stairs and, of course, it was X. He thanked me for a good night and when he went to leave I wobbled over to give him a hug goodbye but my heels got the better of me and I crashed into his chest. He laughed at me and walked me up to my room and put me on my bed, went down to grab me a glass of water and came back up. He sat there with me for a little while longer and one thing led to another and you probably guessed the rest at this point. The next morning I roll over in bed to find no one there, leading me to think that this was all a horrible dream but the pounding hangover I experienced let me know the big party did happen but... X wasn't there so I guess I must have just had a weird dream about him after getting to know him a little more. But as I get up and wriggle into my oversized nightshirt and head downstairs to find X in the kitchen making coffee. 
I scream a little at this as he scared the life out of me. He laughed and walked over to kiss me on the head to hand me the coffee. After some awkward small talk, he offered to drop me off at the coffee shop that me and his brother were meeting at in less than an hour. I declined, but he insisted and dropped me off. My best friend went into detail and I had to explain what happened between me and X that night. He was surprised, but then went on to say how his brother hadn't been with anyone for about four years. Now at this point, this story is probably coming across like some stupid drunk teenager's mistake, and I wish I could just say that was all it was, but X got more possessive. He would wait for me to finish my after-school clubs and my outside school activities just to drive me home and talk to me, and he would send me lots of texts, Facebook messages, Snapchats. The Snapchats were the worst. He would send me dirty messages and pictures that I really didn't want to see calling me baby and his girl, about how he liked me for years and every woman that he had been with was nothing compared to me. I was the woman of his dreams and I was going to be all of his, and about how he was happy he was the only man I had ever been with as he knew I was saving myself for him. I couldn't tell anyone and I couldn't tell my best friend in fear of ruining our friendship. He had been understanding before as he saw how many drinks I had had that night I tried to politely explain to X that I wasn't interested in how he was my best friend's brother and what happened that night shouldn't have happened. He brushed it off and went on with his behavior and went as far as changing his profile picture of a photo of me and him from the 18th in a caption of my beautiful girl, to which everyone was loving and it got over 200 likes on it and everyone saying how we were a beautiful couple including our parents, who commented that they didn't even know that we were dating. I sent him a message telling him to take it down as he and I were not dating, and he brushed me off and carried on with calling me his woman and telling everyone that we're together. I decided to block him on everything and tell my best friend everything who confronted X and tells him to leave me alone. That was four years ago. I'm still best friend with X's brother and X is still maintaining that I'm the only woman for him. I'm beginning to get the feeling that this is never going to end. I hope he will find someone one day, but I will never be that woman for him. I'm a 23-year-old female and this happened to me about three years ago. One day I was driving from college to my house, which is like an hour drive. I just got on the highway and saw a man maybe in his mid-fifties in a white car just tapping on his steering wheel. I thought nothing of it. Then he started tailgating me and I thought it was weird, but I kept on driving. All of a sudden, he changed lanes, speeds up to pass me and he goes back to the lane I was. That's when I realized he was following me and trying to make me stop. So I passed and ignored him, but he kept doing the same thing. I was scared because I still had a 40 minute drive to my home and it was the first time that this had happened to me. So I kept ignoring him until he changed lanes and kept on my side. Then he started hand gesturing saying that I should roll my window down. I said for what? And he asked if I could stop because I had a flat tire. I knew when my car has a flat tire and I didn't have one so I said no. Then he changed his story and said I only want your cell phone number and I kept saying no. I sped up and he kept following me. I was very scared but fortunately there was a police car and the man just stopped following me and took the nearest exit. When I got home, I told my mom what happened and she started freaking out. I didn't know why. I was stunned to what she told me next and she said that she had read a news article the other day of a man that goes after young women and uses that same highway to get his victims to stop because there's something wrong with their car. When they stop, he stops to help, and instead assaults them on the spot. I was surprised and very scared. I don't know if he ever got caught. I looked for news articles, but never found one that confirmed that he was apprehended. I have had quite a few experiences with the paranormal. 
but most of my encounters tend to circulate around my grandmother's house that she bought in 1986. I did some research on the address and I was only able to find one incident. It hadn't even occurred on the property. There was a really sharp turn at the end of the road. Supposedly a man on a motorcycle had crashed and died in a close neighbor's arms. I have considered asking her about this event, but my grandmother said that it may be too traumatic to make her recall. When I was four years old, I apparently told my mother that I wanted to go to Granny's house so that I could play with my friend. When my mother asked me about this friend, I told her that he was the bloody boy on the bike. My mother wouldn't take me back to Granny's for a while after that. I have no recollection of this boy. As I grew older, spending the weekend at my grandmother's house became a regular thing. My twin and I would stay up late to listen to the noises that would sound through the house at night. My grandmother had some antique chairs in the dining room that would squeak if you put weight on them. This would be one of the noises we would hear. My grandmother would always blame the squeaking on her sumo wrestler size Siamese cat. Sadly, the cat developed cancer and had to be put down. The night that he was put down, we, now teenage, twins stayed with our grandmother since she was an utter mess. That cat was like her child. Our grandmother was asleep in her bed and we were staring at our phones in the living room when we began to hear the creaking of the chairs. My sister and I looked at each other with mouths agape. We both knew that the cat was no longer the culprit, so we covered our heads in our blankets. I had a really hard time sleeping that night. The next event occurred when I was about 17. Again, my sister and I were spending the night at our grandmother's house. I had woken up at about 1 in the morning... I groggily looked over to my right. Beside my head was a floating black ball that looked like static with less white light. It was like it was moving while staying in place. I was still trying to comprehend what I was seeing, so I reached over and almost touched it. Even in my confused state, I realized that I probably shouldn't touch it. I pulled my hand back and shut my eyes. It was then that I heard a blood-curdling scream and there was a swift smack to my face. I sat up in a daze and noticed my sister was visibly angry. I asked her what happened. She stated that I had just started screaming, so to fix that, she had to smack me. I probably would have done the same in her position, so I don't hold a grudge. Due to some family issues, I moved out as soon as I turned 18. My grandmother wanted me to continue going to college properly, so she said that I could use her old sewing room until I finished my schooling. I was a bit worried due to my past experiences, but it was a really good offer. It was about two months after I moved in that things started to get scary. I was sleeping soundly in bed when my cat grabbed my hair in its mouth and proceeded to yank my head back. This was really strange behavior since my cat is an absolute love bug. He had never done anything like this before. I sat up on my stomach, crying out in pain. My cat then jumped off my back and out of the room very quickly. Awake and angry at my kitty alarm clock, I turned my head to see something huge standing in front of my dresser that had a mirror. A humanoid figure was standing there as if it were looking in the mirror. It looked as if it were made up of the same material as the ball that I had seen. I sat frozen in fear as I watched this thing turn slightly. It had just noticed that I was awake. The words, It's a girl and run crossed my mind at the moment its non-existent eyes met mine. I don't remember much of what happened next. When I came to, I was flailing my arms on the side of my grandmother's bed. I was in shock. Apparently, I had run screaming through the house for my grandmother, saying that there was someone in the room. Being a strong-willed southern woman, my grandmother proceeded to pull out her pistol in order to go take on the intruder. I was finally able to process what had happened at this point. My grandmother yelled out for me, and when I began to make my way back to my room, I just couldn't believe it. I had to see it again for myself. However, the room was empty. I started shaking uncontrollably. What I saw was not human. My grandmother had me sleep with her that night, but we had to turn on the nightlight before sleep was even a thought. A very similar event took place a few months later, but it was not as chaotic. Again, I had awoken randomly. I looked over to the corner of my room and noticed something crouched down beside my computer chair. It started to stand up. 
It wasn't two seconds later that I blanked out again. My grandmother had told me not to scare her like that the first time, so this time I walked through the house calling out to her, calmly dragging my blanket behind me. My uncle happened to hear me and intercept me before I got to her room. He told me to go back to bed. Being conscious again, I repeated my habit of peeking my head into my room to find the figure. It was the same result. I slept with my light on for three days after that. I am terrified of having another experience like the ones I have encountered. I know it is strange, but I now sleep with two lamps on at all times. It has been about two years since I saw those forms and I still cannot explain them. I thought I was doing well until just recently. Two weeks ago I had gone to sleep with earbuds in. I sometimes listen to ASMR to put me to sleep. When I awoke it was still playing in my ears. It was the sound of someone typing on a keyboard. I was going to pull them out of my ear but I realized that I couldn't move. I had heard of sleep paralysis before but this was my first time experiencing it. I noticed that the sound in my ears was getting louder. It was almost deafening and as it did I began to hear what sounded like laughter. It was a strong male voice. I had listened to this ASMR before and had no recollection of such sounds. I was freaking out. I desperately began trying to lift up my left leg. It wouldn't budge. When I regained my freedom a few moments later I ripped the earbud out and let the tears roll. It was pretty early in the morning so I covered my face with my blanket and cried myself to sleep. I don't know what is wrong with me. I've heard some say that it could be nightmares and others say something is attached to me. I just know that all of these events were extremely vivid. I do believe in the paranormal to an extent but I still tend to lean towards more reasonable reasons. Any answers would be pretty amazing and I hope you enjoyed this. Maybe with some help. I will be able to sleep in the dark again. To start off this post, I'd just like to say that I am a Christian. I believe in God and angels, but I also believe in Satan and demons. I truly believe that the night this happened, I came into contact with a demon. I was getting ready for bed one night in the fall of 2018 when I had a really bad pain in my side. This came out of nowhere and it caused me to have to sit down. I began seeing stars and that's the last thing I remember until I woke up. It felt like something was pinning me down to my bed, sitting on my stomach and holding both my hands down. I started screaming and the thing was gone. Just like that. I ran into my parents' room sobbing and told them what had happened. I believe this happened because I was having a very good night spiritually and Satan didn't like that. I prayed over my room and our house and fell asleep. Nothing like this has happened since. I had never realized how affected I was by this situation until I recently moved back in with my parents. I sleep in the basement of their bungalow we're surrounded by trees and the house is in the middle of a clearing. It gets eerily dark at night, making it hard to see out of the windows whether the room is dark or light. Therefore, it plunged the rest of the basement into complete darkness. I'm always afraid I'm going to look out the window, which has no blinds by the way, and see a figure outlined by the dim light of the moon, or open my door to someone standing in the dark exercise space across from me. The event that sparked this fear is where my terrifying story begins. I lived with my boyfriend, ex now, for about six months before we broke up. We lived with five other people, four of us upstairs, three downstairs. The house was one of those old brick bungalow houses that you'd picture an older couple living in. It was converted into basically all rooms. The living room at the front of the house and the den in the back right corner were converted into rooms Basements don't really matter as it's not a part of the story. To understand, however, you need to know the layout of the main floor. As I said earlier, the living room was in the front left of the house. Mine and my boyfriend's room was on the front right. We shared a wall with the back right roommate and he shared a wall with the bathroom, which was semi-across slash diagonal from our bedroom door. The kitchen was in the back left side where our back door was, which was never, ever locked. 
We lived in the neighborhood of university kids and elderly people, so we never thought it would be an issue. Unfortunately, homelessness and hard drugs were also rampant in our town, and as most do, I never thought we'd be targeted. My job at the time was very physical and required me to drink lots of water, so I was often up multiple times a night going to the washroom. This night was no different. It was about 4.30 a.m. when I got up, an important detail in which I didn't know until later. Usually I'd check the time on my phone to see if I could catch some more Z's before getting ready for work. But knowing it was Saturday and I didn't have to work, I didn't bother with checking. In my just-woke-up haze, I stumbled my way through our bedroom. I'm not sure why, but my body was telling me it was around 6.30 to 7 a.m., meaning my boyfriend, who did work weekends, would be waking up soon. As I opened the door and stepped into the hallway, I heard my boyfriend sleepily say, Hello, in his phone call voice, so I knew he wasn't talking to me. However, for a split second, I thought that the voice came from somewhere in the kitchen, and it almost caused me to step back into the room and close the door. But the feeling slowly passed as I stared into our dark house and came to the ultimate conclusion it was in fact my boyfriend's voice from within the bedroom. Along with keeping our back door unlocked, we usually always kept the kitchen light on. Roommates were in and out at all hours of the night, so it just made it easier for them to make less noise when they got home. But this morning was different, the house was completely black. Out of habit, I looked at both roommates' doors. No light was emanating out of the crack at the bottom, so I knew that they were both asleep. Nosy, I know. I made the quick three steps to the washroom and closed and locked the door. As I was sitting there, my mind started to wake up more, and I began thinking about that voice that I heard, and how it didn't quite sound like my boyfriend, and how, up until now, I realized I never heard his phone ring. My thoughts were quickly cut off when I heard footsteps in the kitchen moving around, then coming over to the bathroom, then towards the back door. Oh, it's just James, leaving for work, I thought. He would often come to the bathroom door to see if anyone was there as the door was eight times out of ten closed. So this reassured me if it was him, he'd just go to the washroom at work. I kind of relaxed and went back to assuming the voice I heard was in fact my boyfriend, and the phone call that he got was from his boss, saying he was late. But something still didn't feel right, and I couldn't shake that sinking feeling in my stomach. I think my brain was trying to keep me calm, knowing I'd have to take those three dreaded steps into the unknown before I was back behind a closed door. I stalled for a couple of minutes. I hadn't heard anything else from the kitchen, so I figured, worst case scenario, if it was someone, they were gone by now. I was still in a sleepy haze and tried chalking up the sounds to my state. I opened up the bathroom door and without success, stared into the darkness of our kitchen to see if I could see anything. Of course, I didn't. I quickly rushed into our room, closed and locked the door and turned towards the bed. My heart sunk. There was my boyfriend, snoring the same as I left him, clearly not having woken up yet. Still thinking... And hoping the voice I heard was his, I shook him. Thinking he'd wake up easily as I was in the washroom for no longer than five minutes, so he couldn't possibly have been in that deep of a sleep yet. It took a minute to wake him up, but he groggily says, What? Clearly annoyed that I had just woken him. Who's on the phone? Don't you have to leave for work? I said. What? He mumbled again. A little more awake this time, he reached over and clicked his phone's home button, lighting up the room a bit. I paid no attention to the screen. I knew he heard me and he was confirming my suspicions that someone was in our house that wasn't supposed to be. I tried again, however, hoping to get a response I wanted. Just a couple of minutes ago, I heard you as I left for the washroom. You said, hello. Was it your boss? He made a sort of angry grunt and rolled over in bed away from me. No one called me, babe. It's 4.30 in the morning. Go back to bed. Although it wasn't loud, I was screaming as the events from the last five minutes crashed over me in a new light, and I was suddenly the most awake I think I've ever been. James, someone's in the house. I heard a male voice say hello. Are you listening to me? There's someone in the house. We argued back and forth, him saying it was a roommate, 
I imagined it, any excuse he could make. He quickly fell back asleep after telling me once again to go back to bed. I stood next to my boyfriend, realization that the voice I heard wasn't his, that it was in the kitchen, as per my original split-second thought, and that the footsteps weren't his. My next memory of the event gripped my heart and I almost sunk to the floor in fear. I never heard a door open or close during the entirety of this event. He, or it, was still in the house. Maybe it was a roommate, I thought to myself. No, no, I didn't hear any of their doors close. Besides, they all knew I lived there and what I looked like. They've had plenty of opportunities to talk to me and haven't, so... They wouldn't pick 4.30am in the pitch black after seeing me exit a room to do it. Maybe a guest. I checked outside our window and saw our one roommate who would have guessed was gone for the night. He often was. And our other roommate was kind of a nerd and I never saw or heard anyone in or out of his room, not even family. The downstairs roommates have their own kitchen so there would be no need for them to be in our kitchen and the only time I've ever seen them upstairs was to ask for our landlord's number after he locked himself out of his room. So it was decided someone was in our house. I blame what happens next on my brain for the second time, trying to lull me into a false sense of security. It's a ghost, I thought. I'm not sure why a ghost would be better than a human, maybe because ghosts can't really hurt you, which after reading these threads and listening to the podcast, I no was dumb of me to think and a human could do physical harm to us maybe they were more dangerous i imagined it was my next attempt at making myself feel better but i know i know that i heard a male's voice clear as day say hello i took a look at my boyfriend and realized that if someone was in our house he wouldn't let anything happen to me nor would the multiple knives that he kept at his bedside table either I woke up a couple of hours later to my boyfriend's alarm. I sat up in bed as he got ready and told him the events that had occurred earlier. He of course brushed it off and said it was probably one of our roommates. I didn't keep pushing for him to believe me which was a factor in us breaking up. I had hoped he'd been too delirious when I woke him up early and would say, oh yeah it was for me but it never came. It's now almost April 26th and I have such a crippling fear of being broken into or having someone watching me that it's affected my sleep in a very negative way. I can feel myself slowly losing grip on my paranoia, which is perfect timing. My parents are going abroad for three weeks on May 1st, leaving me alone in this big house in the forest with just my thoughts to keep me company. It's 2 a.m. and my teeth had fallen out again. My tongue examines the craters along my gum and I pray to find out what was once there. My tongue proves one thing to be true. Every tooth that once rooted itself above my neck and under my nose has escaped me. Salt-filled streams of embarrassment and disbelief move in landslides down my rose-tinted cheeks. My eyes reluctantly glance down to view the contents of my right hand. It seems as if the amount of teeth I hold could caused the tooth fairy to become bankrupt. Every molar, cuspid, bicuspid, and lateral in my hand are no longer included as parts of my anatomy. They become objects. As fear takes possession of me, all that I desire is the comfort and love of my mother. The manifestation has become so intense that my emotions are now identical to that of a child who has lost their favorite toy. My mother suddenly appears in a surreal yet lifelike fashion. Seeing her face instantly creates a shortage upon the growing terror within me. She faces me and then realizes what had happened to my mouth. She realizes what has happened to her daughter. However, she appears to feel no fear or concern for my situation. As a matter of fact, she seemed almost baffled at the level of concern that I express for my teeth, which are non-existent in my mouth and instead in my trembling hands. Haley, don't worry. Those teeth are meant to be temporary. You're supposed to lose those teeth. In fact, you'll grow a whole new set of teeth many times in your life. It's totally normal. A simmering rage mixed with disbelief and confusion bubbled within me. 
The dropping of my jaw and the narrowing of my eyebrows were almost instantaneous. How could my mother be so ignorant? How could she not understand what is happening to me is terrible and abnormal? Emotionally distraught and mentally drained, I belted her. That can't be possible. Something is seriously wrong, Mom. Please listen to me. Then, with a blank visage and seemingly lifeless voice, she responds to me. Just wait. A sensation emerges from my jaws, but it isn't painful. Brand new teeth are raised from beneath my gums in somewhat of a factory machine type way. Each tooth aligned with its neighboring teeth, filling the void amongst my gums, all the while appearing perfectly aligned. My mother was correct, but it doesn't change my fear and confusion towards the situation. Too many questions are left within my mind that I realize cannot be answered. My subconscious vessel begins to fade away at this moment and I become conscious. My heavy eyelids begin to open. I stretch my hand out to grasp my phone in a haze of sleepy drunkenness to check the time. It's 6.15am and I realize that I've had a teeth dream again. Ugh, I hate those dreams. I lie in bed and reflect upon the unpleasantries that emerge from my nighttime dreams. I think about similar dreams that I've had in the past, like the time I had a dream that in between my teeth there were pieces of human nails. Every time that I tried to pry the pieces of nails from the crevices of my gums, more nails would appear. Perhaps some of the most bizarre dreams I had were the ones where my teeth became loose, but they never fell out. The teeth kept themselves sewed to my gums, but they simply were loose and served no purpose. It's a rare thing for a pleasant dream to occur while I sleep, if not a thing of the past. I said my goodbye to sweet dreams when I became diagnosed with depression and started taking antidepressants at the age of 15. I was prescribed a white and navy blue antidepressant known as Prozac. As I held the pill bottle in my hand, I felt hope for the first time in years that I would be happy again, and well, that hope eventually became reality. I felt the physical symptoms of sadness slowly lift off my chest every day. I started to feel alive instead of just purely living. I anticipated that feeling ever since I was a numb 12-year-old girl. That girl isn't numb anymore. As weeks progressed, I noticed drastic changes in my life. Some changes were blessings, other changes were curses. I felt as alive and happy as a clam, but that soon became a different story when I fell asleep each night. I soon would learn the side effects of antidepressants. The most prominent side effect for me would be bizarre and or intense dreams. During most nights, I awoke gasping and praying to God that whatever I had experienced while I was sleeping was fake. What I experienced when I slept was surreal, vivid, and worst of all, violent. It felt like I was there, experiencing every trauma that my subconscious could imagine. On one notable night, I dreamt of a gunman shooting at my school. Every child ran as far and fast as they could away from the school in groups, but somehow the gunman just kept following trying to slay every one of us. It was almost as if it was the Terminator. He was unstoppable. I became afraid to leave my bed when I awoke because my experience felt immensely real. One must understand why antidepressant users continue to deal with such horrific side effects. I could stop taking Prozac and just have decent dreams again, right? What some don't understand is, without the sacrifice of peaceful sleep... I would continue to live my days physically and emotionally numb. There would be no such thing as happiness if I didn't take that blue and white pill every day. Most people believe that once someone with depression is prescribed an antidepressant, they simply become happy and the rest is history. No one usually considers what the negative effects might be for those who take medication for mental illness, and because of this, I live my life trying to educate others around me about mental illness. It's 8 p.m. I have swallowed my happy pill, and in two hours I will start to fall asleep. I accept that torture from my subconscious vessel is drawing nigh. I have grown indifferent towards the consequences of sleep. I used to fear sleeping when I started using antidepressants. I didn't want to submit a part of myself to torture every night, but I became used to it. The more I've accepted that I will have nightmares, the stronger my subconscious and conscious vessels have become towards them. The horrific, violent, and intense dreams are worth my happiness. 
I understand that tonight I may run away from a gunman, I may be assaulted, or parts of my body will be taken from me. I understand that the level of fear in my dreams will be intense and vivid tonight, but I wouldn't trade it for feeling happiness when I'm awake. Two hours have passed, and now I lay in my bed with my eyes growing tired. My eyelids relax, my consciousness slowly shuts down. I can only hope that my teeth don't fall out again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.